All right, so welcome everyone in YouTube. We are here tonight with Nicole Finkelstein of Urban Austin. And we are super excited to have her join us and share about a lot of things related to, uh, to herbs, everything from harvesting, growing, and um, everything from companion planting with herbs. So with that, I will uh, allow her to take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Angel. And thank you all Austin Organic Gardeners. I'm really excited to be here. It's a tremendous honor to be speaking with you tonight. Um, so just to give you a little intro, my name is Nicole Finkelstein. I am a doctor of oriental medicine, licensed acupuncturist, and registered herbalist. Um, I started a small scale herb farm over in East Austin called Urban Austin. Uh, and pretty much I'm a fourth generation farmer. I come from a long line of fruit farmers, believe it or not, and I kind of took a turn and decided to focus more on herbs. So I hope tonight in speaking with you to inspire you to start implementing herbs into your crop plan or your garden plan. Um, and I'm gonna give you some fun tidbits, maybe some uh, unique plants that you can add in and different ways to process them and maybe start to look at uh, your garden space differently uh, and see herbalism as a huge opportunity because we are in a thriving industry that's experiencing a renaissance right now, which is really, really exciting. So, so I want to get into it real quick and just make sure we're all on the same page. If you're wondering what the heck is herbalism, uh, I'm just going to give you kind of a quick and dirty rundown. So herbalism is also known as botanical medicine and basically written records indicate that it was implemented like 5,000 years ago. Um, with the Sumerians and even as far back over in China, but we believe that it actually was in existence to heal the body in different uh, ailments as far as 60,000 years ago. So basically what happens is that uh, humans will utilize plants, particular plants to cure or to treat different medical conditions. So it's natural, it's a really empowering uh, mode of medicine. And it's really exciting that in the United States right now, we're experiencing, again, as I mentioned, a renaissance. So the landscape is changing and it leaves a lot of opportunity for us growers um, to really start to shape the way that herbs are sourced. Um, it's interesting because herbalism is actually unregulated in the United States, not so much over in Europe, but here we have a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, and though it's unregulated and it's still kind of on the fringe, it's starting to really make its way into mainstream. Uh, I'm seeing you know, ashwagandha over in Walmart of all places. So we're really starting to see things kick up, which is exciting. Uh, a lot of studies show the efficacy of healing or using certain plants to heal everything from chronic pain to psycho-emotional disorders and uh, issues. So basically there is a huge gap in the market right now uh, to where there are a lot of people getting into herbalism. A lot of educational programs are starting up, uh, inspiring new herbalists every day. But unfortunately, there's a huge issue with sustainability stateside. Most of the herbs that we receive, even from kind of big companies uh, that are herb providers, are sourced over from China or they're either sourced over from Eastern Europe as well. So not much is being grown in the United States right now, which is really surprising uh, because we're still kind of in that monoculture you know, mindset as far as our uh, agriculture is concerned. So just something to tuck away in here if you're looking for a niche in the organic gardening community. Um, basically, what we tend to focus on in our farm is bioregional herbalism. So I tend to work with a lot of different growers across the uh, United States, and all of us kind of have our regions and different herbs that uh, grow in those particular regions. So bioregional herbalism is just producing what grows best from your particular hardiness zone. And as you know, ours is 8B. So we have a unique a unique position because there's really uh, a lot to overcome in growing herbs in Texas, but then our environment also really lends itself well to growing a lot of herbs in Texas. So we have a fun advantage and a little disadvantage sometimes. Uh, a couple of herb growers that we work with just to throw them out there and give them cred. Uh, we work with Gaia Herb Farm over in North Carolina. We also work with Zach Woods Herb Farm in Vermont. And then we also work with Healing Spirit Herb Farm in New York. So you can probably tell from that list, a lot of our growers of herbs are located in those Northern regions. Uh, so yeah, we have lots of opportunity down here, which is interesting because growing in Texas, I mean, with our tricky climate, 
it actually has a way of creating more potency and more medicinal viability in our herb production. So herbal, herbs become herbs because it's a natural reaction within the plant uh, where the plant's defense system kind of ups its ante anytime it experiences stress. Uh, that could be climate stress, that can be pest stress, that can be just it being trampled. Um, but basically it has a lot of phytochemicals that it produces as a way to defend itself from the outside world. So that's kind of what makes an herb a herb as opposed to a plant. That's a very simplified explanation, but that's all I have time for tonight. Anyway, so basically um, because we have such a tremendous uh, you know, fluctuation in temperature in central Texas, you know, we're, we're getting into the summer months here, which means we're going to start seeing hundred degree temperatures chalk up here pretty soon, but I've been lucky so far this year. But basically what this does is increase the volatile oil content within the plants that we grow, specifically the aromatic plants. And the more volatile oils, the more concentrated the oils are, the stronger the plant medicine. So we have people from all over the country that are seeking out our herbs in particular that we're working with as a company to source to them because our herbs are really good here, which is wonderful. Uh, for instance, holy basil that's grown up in the Pacific Northwest tends to be a little bit weaker than holy basil that we're growing down here in Texas. Um, one story I like to pop out just real quick is my dad, he's still up in Ohio, like kind of on uh, Erie Lake, but they're farming still. And my dad claims that he really likes peppers and can really stand a lot of heat. And I was like, I don't know if you've tried a Texas pepper because there's a big difference. Uh, if even taking a jalapeno grown up there compared to a jalapeno down here, uh, the capsaicin level in the chilies and everything tends to really up with just our high dry heat. So basically I kind of put him to the test and he bit into his jalapeno and he's like, see, no problem, this is fine. And I was like, okay, here's a jalapeno I grew in the Texas summer and he took a bite of that and tears, just tears. So big difference in potency and that's just a little example uh, of the difference. So basically sustainability and herbalism, it goes, there's a lot of things that that term and kind of that phrase encompasses um, specific to our growing practices, there's a lot of things that we tend to implement on the farm to ensure as much of a sustainable system as possible, which herbs in general tend to really lend themselves to a, a sustainable system. So we're working with a wide variety of botanicals. Currently on the farm, we're juggling anywhere from about 72 to 84 plants, uh, or plant varieties. And we'll be growing those you know, throughout the year at different points. We do a lot of experimental grows as well to kind of test out new plants, see how they thrive um, in our environment and see if they're happy growing here. So there's a lot of, you know, testing, a lot of kind of uh, just seeing if things work and it's a lot of fail, but a lot of success as well. So we're working with everything from annuals, biennials, and then also perennials as well. We actually, even though we have an already stressful environment in Central Texas, we'll do things on our farm to intentionally stress out the plants, just again, to kind of up the ante in the volatile oils and chemical constituents that they produce. Um, we'll do things like cutting the irrigation for a couple of days to allow them to wilt. Uh, we'll try trampling them a little bit. We'll even let pests kind of uh, have their way with the crops for just a little bit before we start to intervene. So basically our goal in growing herbs uh, commercially is to try to mimic uh, wild growing situations as much as possible to produce the best medicine that we can. So we don't wanna coddle our plants. We don't wanna baby them because that makes for weak medicine. Um, and uh, some herbs or most herbs for the most part, because they're so aromatic, they themselves are naturally going to be more pest resistant, which is great for us as growers because you don't have to constantly kind of watch over, protect, and uh, guard them against any kind of pet or pest, any type of pest uh, issues, which is good. We'll actually use some herbs in our you know, sprays with, uh, we use all organic, but we'll make herbal tea like out of peppermint and we'll mix that with cold pressed neem oil to go through and do aerial sprays on our plants. And it's kind of the plants are herbally treating each other, which is really nice. So there's a lot of fun opportunities to work with the plants all within under the scope of the farm. So it's also incredibly easy to pepper different herbs into your landscape, uh, as well as your garden beds at home. A lot of them work really well with uh, vegetables that we have just growing in our gardens from season to season. 
Uh, a lot of them actually are landscape plants that you'll see, you know, just driving by neighborhoods on a day to day basis. So it's a matter of thinking beyond the typical pars like parsleys, chives and chamomiles and start to really open up to more Texas natives and the medicinal viability that they offer. Uh, some examples of these plants are going to be like lantana, Turk's cap, prickly pear and horsetail. So all of those are highly sought after herbs that are in landscaping all over the place. So it's easier than you might think. And they're really pretty too. A lot of herbs are pollinator plants. And so you're um, also creating a diversity within your garden space while providing a safe space and a food source for pollinators as well, which is nice. Um, like goldenrod, for instance. So it's interesting because we're actually cultivating what most gardeners would consider to be weeds. But these plants, uh, the perspective is changing kind of in modern society right now. And we're recognizing them for the power that they hold. So it's really exciting. And some of the plants I'm going to suggest tonight are considered weeds, but I encourage you to think differently instead of plucking them from your garden, let them flourish because they actually might have a lot of benefit for you and your family. So some things that I've learned in growing over the years, uh, just in urban Austin, we broke ground four years ago believe it or not, that's crazy. So four years of growing, four years of experimenting, four years of trials and tribulations, and again, successes. Um, the one thing that I've learned, what I really want to encourage with you, or poor, or poor, I recommend it with you in your growing journey, <laughs> is to really think about location, location, location. So it's difficult to take an herb that, you know, it's, First of all, the best thing that you can do is try to learn as much as you can about that particular plant, which you'll be working with, um, and try to understand what its natural growing environment is, what its tendencies are, spacing, shade preferences, water preferences. You wanna to try to investigate as much as you can, just so you can work in your garden space or with your container garden to kind of uh, create an environment that's very similar to its natural growing uh, natural growing conditions. So one, one example I have in this and kind of just to bring it home is we were working with elderberries, which is a very popular herb. And for year, you know, for the first couple of years, I was trying desperately to put elderberry exactly where I wanted it because I needed it to be in this particular row because it worked out in my crop plan. Well, it wasn't having it. This elderberry plant, you know, they really prefer more shade. They prefer more woodland spaces. So finally, you know, within the last two years, I gave up and I was like, forget it. I'm just going to start planting our elderberry in the woodland spaces surrounding the farm area. And since then, they've been thriving. So they've, you know, quadrupled in growth and it's really nice to see. Uh, another thing that we have is horsetail on the farm. And, you know, I'd pop it in the field because we tend to do more row crop farming. Uh, I'd pop your horsetail in the field, which is naturally more of an aquatic plant. It grows on, uh, you know, more so in the beds along creeks and things like that. But I was trying to irrigate it all the time. It was not happy. It was fussy. It was just a struggle constantly. And this is a Texas native. So finally, I wised up and I was like, OK, you prefer to grow in you know, more moist conditions. I'm going to put you in the creek bed right next to the farm because we butt up against Boggy Creek. And since then we've been flourishing. So it's just a matter of understanding what that plant really needs and trying to not to bend it to your will per se, but rather work with the ebbs and the flows of the plant and its natural, um, natural desires. So that's really important. Uh, and there's a number of things that you can do to kind of mimic those, I know on a small scale, mimic that particular environment uh, taking horsetail into example, if you're looking to do more pond, uh, pond gardening or to have a nice pond in your landscaping, horsetail is a great herb to pop in there. Uh, and it's really beneficial for your family and it will start to flourish and you can start to implement that and harvest it for teas. You can use it in hair washes, all kinds of fun stuff. So just working with that and uh, trying to, you know, be flexible, but then also uh, work with the plant itself. So the other thing that's really interesting about herbal cultivation is that it really lends itself to permaculture design. So there's plenty of vines that are medicinal. There's plenty of trees, ground cover plants. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to create, even if you're working within a small garden space, 
you can tier different things with permaculture design, have the plants work synergistically with one another. So a lot of opportunity is there. Additionally, in urban Austin, we're big, at, we're big advocates of guerrilla gardening. Uh, if you're living in an apartment space, I never want an individual to feel limited by that. So, you know, there's different things that you can do. And we teach classes on guerrilla gardening and, you know, making it so it's beneficial for the environment as opposed to you just kind of vandalizing a space with plants as this it was in or, or as if it was possible um, but we work with planting a lot of plant we put a lot of plants in the ground a lot of herbs along the southern uh, walnut creek bike trail that's right against our farm so we're working with that public space but putting texas natives in there as wild grows you know because that prevents or presents an opportunity for us to kind of compare our cultivated plants with their wild grown cousins or wild grown friends. Um, and we utilize this a lot in our growing practices. I kind of use the wild plants as a reference point to our, you know, what we're putting in on the farm. So an example of this is yarrow. So there's a lot of wild stands of yarrow throughout the um, forests and meadows of central Texas, you know, for wildflower season. And I'm constantly checking up on those stands to gauge blooming, to see how pest problems are doing, to see when they start sprouting. So I know when I'm working with domestic cultivation in our greenhouse, I know when to start uh, seeding them. I know when to start, you know, putting them out into the field when the climate is just right for them. So working alongside nature really helps things and really makes life easier for you as a grower. So I definitely recommend, recommend doing that. Um, Kind of a note with guerrilla gardening, I do, and basically with your landscape and gardening as well, is to definitely try to avoid invasive plants as much as possible. There are a lot of herbs that are very popular throughout the states that can be more invasive in our central landscape or central Texas landscapes. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, you want to steer clear of planting things like Japanese honeysuckle, vitex, and chaseberry, even though those are very popular herbs they can cause a lot of disruption within the ecosystem. So um, one thing that I usually reference, which is a really good thing to kind of go through if you're looking to plant more Texas natives, I'm sure you all have seen this before, but we've got the native and adaptive landscape plant guide. So they don't specify specific herbs in this, but there are a lot of uh, medicinal herbs that are found within this book. And also they go through and list off um, a pretty decent number of invasive plants as well, things to avoid. So that's really handy to have, and you can get that at your local extension office uh, if you do not have that reference. So just throwing it out there for you. Um, so basically overall, Paul, the kind of the polyculture nature of herb farming and organic gardening creates a thriving ecosystem um, for our plants and for our critters. So we on the farm, as I mentioned, tend to row crop but we'll do different things to increase a more, or you know, encourage a more sustainable growing practice. So we'll, instead of having one solid row of all one plant, we'll start to do like half the row one plant, half the row the other plant, or we'll do a lot of interspersing to encourage that symbiotic relationship uh, with each individual plant or kind of in the ground on whole. Because plants are not only, you know, pulling nutrients from the soil, they're also, uh, imbuing nutrients into the soil as well. So they have kind of a unique microorganism profile and uh, kind of uh, microbes that they're infusing that kind of help to benefit the soil and also benefit neighboring plants too. Also competition with root growth tends to make the plant stronger on whole. So you wanna to tend to avoid cropping and putting all one particular plant in one area. Uh, another thing to consider in herbal medicine cultivation is that some plants are going to be there for the long haul. So we're looking at our perennial plants, uh, specifically the ones that we're going to be growing for root harvests. A lot of those take anywhere from two to four years to maturity. So they're going to be sitting and hanging out for a while. So when you're going through and working with your garden space and trying to decide what plant goes where and which would or, you know, serve your garden best, it's definitely important to take these into consideration. Uh, some examples of these include echinacea, uh, astragalus, and marshmallow. So all of those are plants that we grow um, for root cultivation, and they sit in the ground anywhere from two to four years. But during this time, we're also utilizing a lot of the aerial parts of the plant or the above ground parts 
because a lot of those parts are also medicinal. So as we know, echinacea tea, you can take the flowers, you can take the buds, you can take um, the leaves and make a really wonderful tea out of it while the roots are maturing. So the plant keeps giving and you want to try your best to uh, nurture that relationship and enjoy it for as long as possible so that the health of the plant doesn't wane. So another thing that's very important uh, is crop rotation, kind of not putting the same member of the same plant family in the same spot season my, um, after season. Uh, we actually had a major issue with this this past year. I made the mistake of putting calendula, which is a member of the Asteraceae family, you know, in a row where Feverfew, another member of the Asteraceae family had been, you know, two seasons prior. So we had asters yellow in the soil, uh, still present and we ended up coming up with a little bit of a disease problem for us. So it's just things like that. And also understanding uh, the botanical nature of your plant, kind of the full profile. Plant families are one of the most important things that you can possibly know and understand about your, your herb. Uh, once you understand how the plant family, like for instance, the mint family, uh, the legume family, uh, all those popular herbs, how they respond and their different requirements, it gives you a little bit of a leg up in growing and cultivating and nurturing that particular plant. So you can give it exactly what it needs. So that all being said, I wanna dive in real quick to the top 10 kind of more unique herbs that you can start to plant in your garden. And believe it or not, even though it is kind of on the cusp of the high heat of the season, you still can put these in your garden. I tried to put together uh, a number of plants that are really like, heat lovers that really do well on our farm in the Texas heat. Um, so you can even put these in the ground tomorrow and be just fine. So, and if not, I'll, I'll let you know. But the first one I wanna really encourage is ashwagandha. And uh, botanical name is Withania somnifera. This is a plant that is hardy to zones eight to 12. So it works well with our climate. It is a fantastic herb to grow in Texas. It does really well in our Texas summers. It thrives in the high heat. Uh, it absolutely adores our alkaline soils as well. So it prefers that over most any other soil type. Uh, additionally, so ashwagandha is a member of the nightshade family and it's a tomatillo cousin. And I've got a visual aid for you. Unfortunately, I'm not technologically advanced. So I've got pictures right here. So this is the ashwagandha plant. And as you can see, it's a, it grows aerial parts anywhere from three to four feet above ground. And then you get tiny husks, kind of like the tomatillos with little berries in the center. And these red berries are great substitutes for rennet and cheese. So we kind of work with them a little bit. So basically with ashwagandha, what you're looking for is a, a good root harvest because that's the part of the plant that's used most traditionally in um, a lot of medicines. And Ashwagandha is a really wonderful one to kind of put in your garden if you're looking to break up hard clay soils because the roots will actually go into the ground and span anywhere from about two to four feet and that's after just one year of growing. So it is a really good one to kind of get up there and break up that heavy clay soil. Um, additionally, it's also a great pollinator plant. Bugs tend to love it, so that's another good thing. Um, this particular herb, uh, if you aren't familiar with it, is technically an Ayurvedic herb, and it's most often used as an adaptogenic. And basically what that means is that this particular herb really helps to build up your stamina, your fortitude. It helps a lot dealing with any type of environmental stress and the way that your body processes it. It also is really good for thyroid health and regulation as well. So there's a lot of wonderful things that ashwagandha can use for, and you can make a tea out of it. You can powder any capsules. Um, I like to use it in all kinds of ways. You can tincture it as well. So there's a lot of um, a lot of uses to you know fully take advantage of ashwagandha's medicine. The other thing is it's a very popular herb. Uh, again, I, I'm starting to see this hit the shelves all over the place. I'm seeing commercials on the nightly news for it. So this is a really great one to grow, and I fully believe that you could have an ashwagandha farm in Texas and do way okay. So it's a good one. So um, just to give you a heads up, this is to like typically in warmer climates, it's grown as a perennial, though we on the farm grow it as an annual, just because once the cold temperatures come in, it's going to completely 
just decimate the aerial parts of the plant while the roots are underground. So we will plant these usually about this time and we'll allow the plants to establish and basically we'll kind of let them do their thing. First frost comes and then we go ahead and knock off all the aerial parts of the plant, leaving the roots below. We go through and harvest the roots in autumn to about winter. So that's like prime time to go through and get your ashwagandha root. So um, one of the things that I really like about ashwagandha because it is a member of the nightshade family is that you can kind of play with companion planting a little bit. And I know some folks consider companion planting to be a pseudoscience, but you know, just like biodynamic farming practices, I myself have seen a big difference uh, in how plants work together and how they grow when they're paired with particular plants. So I stand behind it, even though some folks kind of poo poo it. So just to let you know, but basically ashwagandha is a really good companion plant for basils, as you would expect. Um, mints that tend to die back. I would kind of steer clear of mints that are a little bit more aggressive, like, um, you know, your traditional garden mint. I would steer clear of peppermints and things like that, just because it becomes a huge mess with the tangling of the roots and the vines and the runners. So avoid that, just mints that die back. Um, garlic is another good one that pairs well with ashwagandha and borage as well. So those are really good ones. You could actually work with any annual plant that you want in conjunction with ashwagandha uh, as they tend to die back. And basically what you're left with is going to be the root. So it's convenient to plant with other root crops, that being said, for just easy harvesting. Okay, the next plant I recommend for your garden is going to be what's called astragalus, also known as huang qi in Chinese medicine. So astragalus membranaceae is also an adaptogen plant. So again, good to kind of build up stamina and good to kind of help with stress, anxiety. Um, I give this to a lot of patients that are dealing with, uh, you know, coming off of a long illness, a lot of elderly patients, things like that to kind of build up their systems and make them stronger. So it's a wonderful plant. Uh, it is hardy to zones four through 10 and astragalus is going to be native to China, but it grows really well in central Texas once it is established. And it is a member of the Fabiaceae family or the legume family. So it's also a great one to have in your garden because it actually will go through and fix nitrogen to the soil. So that's pretty wonderful. We're looking at the roots primarily as a source, you know, a part that we harvest and utilize. Uh, root harvests tend to happen with astragalus anywhere from two to three years so that they reach medicinal maturity. Um, again, because they do have strong root systems, it's another great one to go through and start to break up your clay pan in your garden. So thrives really well. Uh, in that type of environment, um, but it does really, really well if you have well-drained soil, so you can kind of play with that there. Uh, this too is a very popular herbal product, especially post-2020 as everybody's starting to recuperate a little bit. Um, as far as cultivation goes, seeds do require a little bit of maintenance up front, so we typically, you know, around February, we'll start to go through in the greenhouse and seed astragalus, the seeds themselves require a little bit of scarification, and then we typically will soak them overnight in a kelp diluted, um, in a kelp dilution or seaweed dilution, because this basically encourages the eventual uh, nitrogen fixing nodulation. So they require a little bit of extra care, but you want to start them indoors until they get about yay high, kind of get some strength build up, and then you can plant them in the spring before the high temperatures hit. Uh, the flowering parts are going to be, the aerial parts do flower, so it makes it a nice beneficial pollinator plant for your garden. Um, and the plant will start to die back in the freezes and in the frost, but the roots remain. So there's another garden one for you. Oh, I forgot. This is what astragalus looks like. So you can tell with those flowers, or not flowers, but rather all those leaves. So it's a really nice one to have in the garden. Okay, moving right along, number three, I recommend planting Moringa. So you may have heard of Moringa. It's another one that really got some or gained some popularity over the last couple of years. Uh, Latin name is going to be Moringa oleifera. Olefer I'm terrible with Latin binomials. I'm so sorry. Oleifera. There we go. And it is hardy to zones from nine to 12. So it is really a heat lover. This is one that gets a little bit tricky for us, especially once the colder temperatures set in, but we grow it as an annual on the farm and it's a right, a very fast growing, fast germinating tree. 
it lends structure to any other plants. If you want to do some companion planting with uh, peas or any type of vines that like to climb like Passiflora, this is a really good one um, to have in your garden space. And then it provides shade during the summer months as well. So beneficial. It is native to Northwest India and, and typically cultivated throughout the tropics and subtropics as well. So our friends over in Houston and Galveston tend to have a much easier time with Moringa than we do. They can keep it as an annual and actually have it as a tree. But I will say, if you go over to the Festival Beach Food Forest, they have outstanding Moringa stands. I don't know how they do it because mine die back every single year. So it must be something with the heat off of 35 or maybe the city. I don't know, they're in a special bubble. So if you wanna visit a Moringa in all its glory, I recommend going to the Festival Beach Food Forest. So this is a plant that likes full sun. It likes driest soils once established and it's not really picky on the soil type. So you can grow it in a container, you can take it in in the cold or you can put it out in your garden. Um, I try to put it up against the structure so it gets a little bit of residual heat and has a good windbreaker. It's a very generous plant. Virtually every part of the tree is useful as either a food source or as a medicine. So the leaves can be consumed, the immature seed pods can also be consumed and they taste really similar to asparagus. So really packed full of vitamins A, C, there's a lot of calcium, iron and potassium in them. So Moringa is known as a famine uh, I can't remember the exact term. It's a good plant to have if there's a famine, God forbid. So this is one that is a good food source and really uh, can kind of carry you through nutritionally if you're lacking in any particular vitamins and nutrients and minerals during a famine. So uh, medicinally, Moringa is anti-inflammatory. It also has pain relieving properties as well. So that's great. Uh, again, it germinates quickly, grows rapidly. Uh, and is a really great plant for what we typically like to pair it with is uh, like blue butterfly pea or any type of climbing beans. So it's a good one there. And here's a picture of a Moringa plant. So you actually within, I'd say about a year's time could probably get it up to that status if well taken care of. So they are very rapid growers, much like bamboo. So it's a good one to have and to try your hand at. Okay. So I mentioned blue butterfly pea, which happens to be our fourth garden plant that I recommend. Blue butterfly pea is absolutely gorgeous. I love this plant and it is very popular. So you can probably uh, take a gander at that flower presentation and understand why its Latin name is referred to as Clitoria ternatia. So it is a beautiful plant and it is hardy to zones nine to 12. And it's technically native to Africa, but it's grown predominantly over in Southeast Asia and used and cultivated um, over there. It grows well here with a little bit of TLC. So that's, um, I tend to grow it as an annual because it doesn't handle the cold temperatures well once we have it, but you can plant it right now. Um, I actually can recommend that you go over to the Garden of the Ancients if you wanna go and start with a already grown like starter plant or transplant. Uh, they have blue butterfly pea available there, so you can try your hand at it. So in winter or like warmer climates, it is a biennial. So this is an extremely popular flowering herb. And because it has a really fun kind of attribute to it that you may have seen before, but I have some right here. So this is just straight blue butterfly pea. And I don't know if you can see, but it's blue all the way through. So it's kind of a natural food dye. And it's really, really pretty to work with. You can work with it in baked goods and everything. And it's also pH sensitive. So when you go and you add a little bit of uh, acidity to it, you can actually change the color. Let's see if it'll work for me. Ah. Well, I can't tell so much, but that just turned fuchsia and purple. It's not translating through the camera so well, I'm sorry, but it's a really beautiful, beautiful color. And I wish you yeah, it turns out a maroon. It turns, yeah, yes, exactly. So I think I did a little bit of a stronger dilution of it. So when it's a little bit lighter, you can see that it's a really pretty, uh, like fuchsia magenta maroon color. So anyway, it's a great natural food coloring. Um, and then basically, it's also because you can tell from the coloration, it's very rich in antioxidants, which makes it really helpful in kind of uh, healthy skin production hair production, it's known as an anti-aging plant, so it's a good one to have uh, if that's of interest to you. 
Additionally, it's also anti-inflammatory uh, among a million other things. Blue butterfly pea is a really special and beneficial herb. So uh, several studies actually indicate that because blue butterfly pea has a chemical in it called acetylcholine, that it actually is beneficial in brain, you know, brain function. So it helps you to think more clearly. It kind of increases acetylcholine in your brain and your body and helps prevent memory loss uh, and helps improve memory all the way around. So wonderful plant to have. Uh, additionally, as you can guess, blue butterfly pea is a member of the legume family. So it's a Fabiaceae and it has nitrogen fixing abilities as well. So it's beneficial to our bodies and then also our garden spaces. So it is drought tolerant once it has been established. That's the trick is getting it established. So it handles a, like saline and soda soils really well. It can thrive in kind of a little bit more mm, unfavorable soil types, which makes it great. Uh, additionally, the seeds are a little bit finicky when it comes to germination. They are to be started. Usually about this time, you can start to seed blue butterfly pea. Um, you wanna scarify the seed and then also again, soak it in a seaweed dilution. Uh, diluted seaweed water so that uh, it can increase germ rate and kind of help uh, help you to have more success in seeding it and planting it. You can also start it indoors. It can grow indoors and then you can move it outside if you would like as well. So, okay, so that's blue butterfly pea. The next plant that I recommend putting into your garden, if you don't already have it, is going to be holy basil or oxymong sanctum. And here is a picture of it right here. Beautiful Tulsi is another name for it, so Tulsi. Mm -hmm. And basically Tulsi is going to be hardy to zones 10 to 12, which I find interesting because it really, it thrives here very much so. So there's a lot of different varieties. They tend to grow as bushy annuals here in Texas. Uh, they love our summer heat somehow. I don't know how, like they are just like, yay, it's a hundred degrees, I'm great. So a really great one to have in your summer garden, especially when we're kind of waning in flower production. This is an excellent pollinator plant. Bees go nuts over it. It's really wonderful and it's very aromatic as well. So it's a joy to have around. So it makes a wonderful tea and uh, naturally, holy basil oh, is really good for reducing <laughs> any type of stress, anxiety. It's really, handle, or really handy for anybody that's going through any type of heart disease. Uh, or is having blood sugar regulation issues. So regular consumption of uh, holy basil is really helpful to kind of help with those issues. Uh, it does grow densely in the ground. So we tend to use it to protect the soil in the summer around other herbs that maybe aren't so happy to be alive in the summer like Minarda or bee balm. Uh, it is closely related to culinary basil. So it does work as a companion plant for tomatoes and it has a really good uh, pest control ability as well because it is so aromatic it tends to ward off mosquitoes aphids you know things like that that aren't too keen on those very aromatic plant aromatic plants so holy basil is number five and number six for your garden is going to be california poppy i recommend uh i'm going to butcher this latin binomial so i apologize it is uh Eschus <laughs> i almost don't even want to try it Eschislausia californica. Basically, it's this one. This beautiful, beautiful plant. And California poppy is hardy to zones five through nine. This is a very drought tolerant plant. It thrives in dryness, which is wonderful. Um, we actually use it on the farm as a cover crop. I'll typically go through and direct seed or broadcast seed California poppy in between my slow growing shrubs like rosemary, like some of our lavenders when they're just getting established as well. So uh, it has a good way of protecting the soil and kind of filling in blank spaces in the garden. It prefers full sun, poor soil, and it absolutely hates to be coddled. So the rain that we had and all the wonderful weather, California poppy is just like, oh, no, thank you. So the more harsh the environment, the more dry the summer, the happier California poppy is. It's also a very generous herb in that we harvest every single day. I think we're on harvest like 300 by now. I'm not even kidding because <laughs> we'll basically go through and harvest all the blossoms only to come out the next morning, maybe not even 24 hours later to find that all the blossoms have completely replenished themselves. So very generous. 
uh, a very wonder or a wonderful pollinator plant for any of the bees and uh, kind of creepy crawlies in your garden as well. So it is a ballistic self seeder. And so basically what that means is that the seed pods, which tend to look like very long and skinny bananas, once they dry out, they pop. And so at the end of summer, I can go through California poppy patches and I can just hear pop, 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 and feel seeds just kind of hit you. So it's a really fun one if you bump up against it. Um, basically, the California poppy is in the poppy of ACU family. So it is a cousin to the opium, opium poppy, but it is much more mild. It doesn't have those addictive constituents, so you don't have to worry about any problems there. It actually is gentle enough to give to children and it can be taken more long-term. So this is just like its cousin, going to be really helpful in kind of calming down the system. It's a nervine, so it's going to take your central nervous system and just relax it so that you can take a deep breath and kind of chill for a second. Uh, additionally, it also is really relaxing to the muscles. So if you have any pain, it also is an analgesic as well. So very light, but very helpful. So you can make it into a tea and just drink it as is. You can have it fresh, you can have it dried. It's very versatile, which is wonderful. Um, it does have a slight bitterness. So sometimes I like to go through and make syrups out of it uh, for kiddos and things like that. It tends to help them take it down a little bit more. Okay, so the next plant that I have to recommend to you is mullein. And you may have seen these around roadsides. Typically this is an, or a weed, but it's a beautiful beneficial plant and herb that's also very popular in the field of herbalism. So this is a very easy garden addition for you. Uh, it's a huge plant. I mean, it's almost prehistoric in size. We have some mullein plants that get up to about seven to eight feet tall in their second year of life. It is a biennial plant. So the first year it just kind of, you know, spreads its leaves or its basal rosette. Um, and the rosette can get to anywhere to be about like three to four feet wide. So it requires a good bit of space, um, but it is drought tolerant. It prefers really crummy soil. Uh, it also covers a lot of ground. So you get some soil protection in there as well. And it's also self seeding. So that's a good benefit as well. Um, we have a lot of volunteer mullein plants on the farm. We just kind of let them go and they just do their thing. So it provides a little bit of shade in its second year, but the leaves are so soft. It's referred to as nature's toilet paper. So it's a really wonderful comforting plant to have. Uh, additionally, it also is beneficial for the respiratory system. This was one of like the most popular herbs for COVID time because obviously respiration, you know. Uh, so it was really good and a good plant to have during that particular time or still in this time. In the second year of life, it produces a spire and will start to bolt and then yellow flowers are produced. And basically you can use the yellow flowers and by infusing them in oil and it helps a lot with earaches. Um, so this is a really good one to have if you have any kids that like to swim in Barton Springs on a regular basis. So mullen is a great addition. Um, we use this typically also as a base medicine or a base plant for a lot of our smoking blends, as again, it really helps to nourish the lungs and protect against any um, outside environmental like ozone issues. So really helpful for that. Or you could have it as a tea as well. Um, so mullein is a really great plant to go next to echinacea or coneflower, sages and sedums. So it's a good one for that space. Take a drink real quick. Pardon me. Okay, so around in the corner here, almost done. I've got number eight plant to put into your garden. Recommended is going to be motherwort, and this is Leonurus cardacia. Beautiful plant. This is another one that grows pretty tall, and it's another biennial as well. It is a member of the mint family, and it is relatively drought tolerant, surprisingly, unlike most mints. So it handles the heat pretty okay. Within the first year of growth, it kind of will stay close to the ground. Um, you wanna you know, just take care of it, but it doesn't require a lot of coddling. And then the second year is when it's really gonna start to shoot up and you'll get beautiful purple spires on it that are rich in nectar flow and bumblebees love them. So this is a really great plant for pollinators to have in the garden. So it can actually grow up to be about five feet tall. Uh, it's a really beautiful plant. It does sometimes get little pricklies on the seed heads once the flower goes to seed. So just a heads up there. 
but uh, it provides a good windbreak for a lot of plants if you're looking to protect some from the spring winds, especially. Um, it's revered as a medicinal plant for its abilities to go through and aid in heart health. So like its Latin binomial, Leonor, Leonoris cardacia, hearts cardacia, the cardiac system all the way through. So it's a great one for somebody that's dealing with any like heart palpitations, you know, chest tightness, heart disease, anybody that's going through a lot of anxiety, this is a wonderful plant to have on hand. So it's called motherwort because it was especially favored for women as they were kind of in their postpartum stages of pregnancy or, you know, after the baby's born, it would go through and nourish the anxieties and kind of replenish the body. So really good uh, plant to have for women's health medicine, as it also has an affinity for the uterus. So I absolutely recommend having some motherwort in your garden space if you have any uh, feminine nature individuals. So the actual chemical constituent, active chemical constituents of motherwort, it's unique in this, it's most potent when it's in full bloom. So this is unlike a lot of other herbs, which makes it pretty unique. So this is a good one to have um, when you're going through and harvesting, if you decide to grow it. It pairs really well with chrysanthemums and other plants that kind of need a little bit of protection from the spring. And I use the aerial parts or the above ground parts to make tea blends. Uh, we'll dry it and use it there, or else I'll make syrups out of it because it does have a little bit of a bitter, spicy flavor to it. So kids, if you know, if you want them to have it, a little sugar goes a long way. Um, or you can also can tincture this plant as well and use it. Okay, number nine is dandelion. So dandelion, I know, ugh, the weed, and you probably all know, are well familiar with this in your garden spaces. But dandelion is such an amazing plant and it just does not get the credit that it deserves. So Taraxacum officinalis is its official name and it's technically hardy to zones three to 10. So dandelion in planting these, it may feel counterintuitive, but it's a biennial plant that is one of the most amazing food and medicine sources that we have. And it grows abundantly, it grows without any effort whatsoever. So every part of the plant is either medicinal, edible, or both. So uh, we're actually starting to see, or I'm actually starting to see uh, from Johnson's Backyard Garden that they're sourcing dandelion greens over to Central Market. So we're starting to see a change in the perspective in the landscape, which is really exciting. And this also uh, introduces an opportunity for farmers to produce another crop that's highly sought after, uh, something that's a little bit different. So it has a fun flavor profile as it's a little bit more bitter. Um, not so much in arugula sort of way, but as in like a spent kale kind of way. Uh, younger leaves tend to be a little bit more fresh, a little less bitter, but uh, if you saute it with some garlic, it's absolutely delicious. So I absolutely recommend trying it if you have not. Um, the flowers of dandelions can be made into syrups and they also can be made into dandelion wine. The roots are incredibly powerful. They can be roasted and used as a coffee substitute um, or just have them as a tea, as I like to have every night. So they're nutritionally dense plants. Um, they provide iron and plenty of trace minerals. And it's also a diuretic herb. So if you have anybody that tends to hold a lot of water, or if you're a female that's um, tending to bloat with menstruation, having dandelion is a good way to re-regulate your body. It also clears the biliary, the biliary system, your gallbladder and your ladder, or your gallbladder and your liver. So it keeps everything flowing in that department, uh, helps to kind of break up stones or any issues there. And it actually will go through and clear heat from any topical infections, especially where there's pus present. So dandelion is very powerful. And again, it does not get enough credit. Um, I, a dandelion was one of the most important herbs that I used in my recovery from alcoholism, as again, it has a way to regenerate the liver and really kind of clean everything out so that you feel right as rain uh, if you're in recovery. So interestingly enough, you can get multiple harvests off the aerial parts. Um, we tend to grow dandelions and leave them in the ground for two years at a time. They develop that nice long tap root that will go through and harvest in the fall on the plant second year. Um, dandelions, if you're looking to put them in your garden, they actually produce naturally an um, enthylene gas, which helps fruit to ripen, ripen more readily. So this is a really handy plant to put 
buy tomatoes or any peppers and things that may be in the ground a little bit later if you want them to hurry up and ripen. So it's a fun one and definitely beneficial. Plus it adds a little bit of ground cover as well. Okay, and lastly, that brings me to my most wholehearted uh, plant that I can recommend to you. And that is going to be comfrey or Symphytum officinalis. And there's a picture of comfrey right there. Beautiful purple flowers, nice large grower. This is a great plant to have in every single garden space. It is hardy to zones four to eight. Um, it tends to be invasive in some areas of the country, but not here in central Texas. So we're good to go. This is one of the most beneficial plants that you could possibly grow for your garden. Um, sometimes I grow comfrey just for the sake of having it as a mulch because it's interesting in that it has a very high protein content in the leaves and the foliage. foliage. Um, additionally, it also has a chemical constituent that's called allantoin, 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 mm. uh, A-L-A-N-T-O-I-N. Not gonna go on my pronunciation here, but basically what this chemical does or chemical constituent does is to go through and help proliferate cell growth. So this makes everything around comfrey or any plant that's mulched by comfrey grow tenfold. So it's a really great one to go through and kind of spread around your garden space. Um, it is the quintessential companion plant. We'll say that. Additionally, it's also incredibly high in protein, as I mentioned before. So this makes an excellent food source for livestock and chickens. I made the mistake one year of letting my chickens free range in our field or one of our main fields. And unfortunately they went through and went right for the comfrey and demolished the entire row. It was over a hundred plants that were just gone in an instant. So they recognized the value in uh, comfrey plants, which is unfortunate for us, but great for them. Um, additionally, comfrey is also really handy to have in your compost as it has a great source of nitrogen and again, those uh, chemical constituents and proteins will help to benefit your garden on whole. So it is also a pollinator plant. Uh, it grows wide and it has the nice kind of purple bells that tend to hang off. Uh, bumblebees go nuts over them. Hummingbirds love them. Like comfrey is just a great plant all the way around. Additionally, so when we're looking more for how we can use it as humans, because it has the con or the chemical allantoin. Uh, it makes it really valuable as a first aid plant. So typically what I'll utilize comfrey for is to kind of use the fresh leaf. And if I have a sprain, uh, if a friend of mine might have like a fracture or a, you know, a bruise or anything like that, I'll crush the leaves and I'll make a poultice or pack it and wrap it so that that leaf is just right there on that spot so that all those chemicals can be absorbed into the skin and reach those soft tissues because that allotoin is going to help regenerate cells. It's going to help heal any type of soft tissues and ligaments. So it's a really great first aid plant to have around. So um, I don't recommend, mm, this is, it's controversial in the herb world because a lot of folks have had some issues internally taking comfrey. So I typically recommend just keep it on the outside of your body unless you're working with an experienced practitioner who can kind of guide and guide your um, dosage and things like that. Additionally, you don't wanna use comfrey on open wounds, again, because those chemical constituents can enter the bloodstream and cause you some issues. So tricky, but if you keep it topical on just like bruises, sprains uh, and fractures or broken bones, it's a very effective and wonderful plant. So typically I'll go through and seed uh, I'll seed comfrey in the cold months. You can direct seed it into the soil because it does require a little bit of cold stratification just so the seeds are ready to grow. Um, you can start them indoors and then plant them outside, you know, once the first or the last frost has hit. Um, yes, and it produces foliage in the spring and then foliage, and we're still having it produced, especially with all this rain. So it tends to kind of die back and get sad uh, once the very high temperatures hit, but Comfrey throughout the entire garden. It's a great one. So those are my top 10 recommendations for you. I want real quick just to give you a heads up. Um, if you're going through and you have all these beautiful herbs in your garden, you're like, what do I do with them? I'll tell you kind of what we do and offer some guidance on processing. Um, so basically harvesting herbs, we have two harvest seasons, 
uh, set throughout the year. So we have right after spring, we're in prime harvest mode right now before the summer temperatures hit. And then we'll have another prime harvesting season anywhere from probably November to December. So those floral crops, those uh, root crops all come um, to fruition during that time. But technically we're harvesting throughout the entire year. It all depends because certain herbs just reach maturity at certain times. So keeps you on your toes for sure. Um, I do recommend that you do a little research again with the plant's life cycle as all of them tend to be a little bit different. Uh, learn when your plant is at its peak medicinal viability when you're looking to go through and harvest your herbs. So um, energy tends to move through, so you have a seed and the energy is going to be focused from that seed in germination. It's going to move up into the aerial parts and it's gonna work on producing a flower typically unless it's a biennial, but it's gonna work on growing. So all the energy and the medicinal viability is going to be mostly in that plant part. And this is a generalization, but just to give you an idea. So you wanna take the plant parts when the seed or you know when the foliage is at its finest or when the flower head is at its finest. And then once the flower head tends to turn and goes into seed production, all the energy goes right back into the root system. If it is a perennial plant or a biennial, or if it's an annual, it'll die back altogether. So just understanding that will give you a key indication of when you wanna harvest your plant. Um, some plants are, again, more like motherwort we were talking about. It's gonna be at peak medicinal viability when it's in full bloom, whereas other plants, once they go to flower, their medicinal viability is no good. So just a little bit of research is required on that, and I'm happy to help with you with questions. You want to be as considerate as possible when you're going through and harvesting, especially this time of year. So the general rule is to try to only take one third of either the full crop, or if you just have one plant, just take one third of that plant. It's uh, because you're growing this, not just for medicine, but you know, for all the benefited uh, animals and insects in your garden and your garden's ecosystem, you wanna leave a little bit behind for them. So that's part of that sustainability model that we wholeheartedly implement on our farm. Uh, additionally, we use that one third, uh, once it's gone and once it's spent, we'll use that as our seed saving or for seed saving rather. So seed production off the one third, and then we're completely set with a plant that's already uh, custom, accustomed to Texas growing in, and it's all ready for next year. So instead of going through and buying seeds every year and waiting for the plant to adjust to our climate, these are already good to go. Okay, so when you're harvesting, volatile oils tend to be at their peak concentration around noon or the high point of the day, uh, or just after the dew dries is another good rule, especially as we're getting into the high temperatures. Some herbs like calendula are gonna be more resinous at the highest point of heat of the day. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but you wanna get it as soon as it is the hottest point of the day. Uh, you should end up with sticky fingers if you're working with a really resinous plant. That's how you know that it's chock full of medicinal viability. So right now, because we're hitting, we're gonna get up into the 90s and to the hundreds, maybe not though, uh, you wanna try to avoid depleting the plant as much as you can while the summer temperatures are rising. So you definitely wanna either harvest as the dew is drying first thing in the morning, or sometimes we'll go through and harvest in the evening hours too. So it's not taxing the plant further. So just a heads up as well, when you're going through and harvesting your aerial parts of the plant right now, uh, plant material just does hold on to heat. So this becomes a very big issue in, uh, in the fact that the heat of your harvested plant material is gonna to start to break down that plant material almost immediately. So you don't wanna just go ahead and leave it sit and just kind of let it hang out in the sun. You wanna to try to get that plant material or that harvest cooled off as soon as possible. So pop it in the cool storage, pop it in the fridge, pop it in the, you know, in a shady spot on a tarp just to kind of take it out of the heat and let it, you know, cool down a bit. That will prevent deterioration because you want to try to maintain those volatile oils as much as possible so you're creating a great uh, medicinal plant. So uh, in processing, just some things that you can do on your own uh, at home methods when you finally have all your plant material harvested. Uh, you want to try again to process them as soon as you possibly can. 
you want, if you want to keep your plants fresh and use them in cooking or, you know, in teas and things like that, typically what I recommend is that folks keep everything in a Ziploc bag or a nice Tupperware container, and you want to keep it in there in the fridge with a damp paper towel, not a wet paper towel, a damp paper towel. That's going to keep all the cells nice and juicy. It's going to help the main or the plant to maintain integrity as well. Uh, typically, I'll let them stay in the fridge for anywhere from one to one and a half weeks. So that's a, kind of a general rule that I go by. Or if you want to have the plant on hand and have it for future tea, another thing I recommend is kind of blending it with broth or with water uh, and then freezing it in an ice cube tray because that's a really nice way to just have your fresh herbs on hand uh, throughout the entirety of the year. So that's another trick. So when going through and drying your plants, I typically recommend if you're drying the aerial parts of the plants, the leaves, the stems, the flowers, you want to try to avoid a dehydrator. I know it seems counterintuitive because you want to suck the moisture out, but unfortunately, a lot of commercial dehydrators will go through and have a very high heat point to where it will cut all the volatile oils and reduce the potency of that medicine. So by the time you pull it out and it's dry, it's also brown and sad and lifeless. So I don't recommend drying things that way or aerial parts of the plant. You want to, again, maintain the volatile oils as much as you can. Heat destroys volatile oils across the board. Sunlight destroys herbs. So that's another thing. You want to keep everything in a nice dark place. Um, some of the best at-home methods that I have to recommend are keeping it in a cardboard box in a closet with a fan going. Uh, or a paper bag also works really well as well. So basically the cardboard and the paper bag will go through uh, and wick away the moisture from the herbs and allow them to dry more regularly. And you wanna go in through and shake them up every once in a while, just to kind of keep things circulating and keep them uh, all parts exposed as much as possible. The other thing that I recommend if you have the space is to go through on, you can either take a screen or a nice dry rack or you, know, you can get, it doesn't have to be fancy. Put all your herbs out on a single or in a single layer on a screen or a dry rack, um, or you also can hang them upside down in a dark space in the closet and keep a fan going in that closet. Um, you know, I typically recommend it being climate controlled because you do not want temperatures to exceed 85, 90 tops. You want to try to keep the temperatures below that point because that's going to help to maintain that medicinal viability for you. You want to encourage as much air circulation as possible. You want to agitate them sometimes so that you can get all plant parts exposed as well. Um, what we typically do when I have my dry closet is I will go through and put a small dehumidifier at the base of the closet and help the fan to go and it just creates a, it kind of expedites the drying process. So I recommend doing that. We have on the farm a large scale dry house. We actually converted one of our greenhouses over. And this helps a lot with our processing, especially when we're pulling hundreds of pounds of herbs out of the field during a harvesting. So this is kind of a basic picture of our stripped down dry house. It doesn't look like that just yet, but you can see we have the fan setups. There's even more fans. We have exhaust going, hanging dry racks. We have racks on the sides now too. And then this is a picture of our farm manager, Mo. And she's over there with our Tulsi harvest, putting everything into the dry rack. And then we'll just keep those in there. Typically uh, in working with the dry house, it takes about a week for everything to go through. If the humidity isn't like it has been. Uh, humidity is tricky in Texas. It's, it's real tricky. That's why if you have a climate controlled space like a closet, I recommend that a thousand times over. So life goals, we'll see. Some people actually use uh, shipping containers and that'll actually go through and be more climate controlled for like a lot of the large scale herb companies. And that seems to go pretty well. Okay, once you have your dried herb, the process to go through and separate the herb from the stem is called garbling. We'll go through and take a screen and kind of rub the dried plant material on the screen to where all the particulate will go and fall through to a base container that we keep it in. Uh, and then you're left behind with the stems and the parts of the plant that you don't want to be using in your product or your teas or what have you. So garbling is that process. Now, contrary to what I'm telling you right now, if you're working with denser herbs or harvesting things like roots, branches, uh, mushrooms, or like barks, typically more dense 
herbs. And when I say mushrooms, I'm talking reishi, um, you know, things like that, that tend to have a little bit of a density to them or like turkey tail. They can stand to be in a dehydrator. You can put them in your dehydrator. They will hold up because their cell walls are a lot more dense and close together. They won't be leaching a lot of medicinal viability uh, or all the oil content in those tend to be you know, somewhat lower. So when you're going through and working with them in a dehydrator, you wanna make sure that you dehydrate them or dry them out to what we call cracker status or cracker dry. And that's where when you take it, it should snap with a pop. There shouldn't be any bending. There shouldn't be any flexibility because that's indicative of moisture present in the plant material. If you have any plant material that with moisture in it, it's gonna tank the entire batch. And I cannot tell you how many times I have let that happen and it is heartbreaking. So I don't wanna see you do that. Definitely wanna make it sure everything is crunchy, everything is cracky. Um, you prefer, it's not great to have things uh, to powder status, but just crunchy, cracky. Uh, aromatic, aromatic parts of the plant can be kept in uh, dark containers or you know, glass containers in the dark, make sure they have an airtight seal on them. Um, aerial parts can be kept for up to eight months. That's the leaves, the flowers, you know, things like that. And then dense parts like the roots and the barks, they can keep and last up to a year and still be medicinally viable. Sometimes you can get them to sneak by a little bit further. So that's pretty much herb farming in a nutshell. <laughs> and again, this is a quick and dirty, uh, quick and dirty combo, but you know, I, I really hope that you feel a little bit encouraged that I gave you some takeaways tonight. Uh, and again, I'm here as a resource. If anybody has questions, um, we also have Carolyn of Seven Feathers Apothecary. She's another wonderful grower in Texas. Um, so we're, you have resources available to you and new growers are starting to pop up every day. And I hope you become one of them. Uh, if you are interested more in medicinal herb farming, we are going to be having a six month farming program starting in 2021 from January until June of next year, where we're going to pretty much go from seed all the way to medicine or sale, if you'd like. So we're going to take you through everything and share what we do on the farm, have you work hands on uh, to learn how to do it as well. Uh, additionally, if you'd like to check out and see what the heck we're doing, we're on Instagram predominantly at urban underscore Austin. Uh, and then every Sunday from 10 o'clock until two o'clock, we are at the Texas Mueller Market Stand as well. And I would love to meet you all in person. I'm bummed I didn't get a chance to be in person tonight, but I'm really happy to be here via Zoom and really happy to just have the opportunity to speak with y'all. Thank you. So we have some questions from the chat and uh, people might have questions also. Um, so I think the first one was, is it possible to start seed from, for ashwagandha? Absolutely. This, All this of our time ashwagandha. Of this time of year. So. Yes. Yep. They tend to be, again, uh, they're relatively fast germinators and they thrive in warmer temperatures. So they they still can be started right now. Um, I recommend kind of protecting them a little bit as you get them in the ground. Once we hit those hundred degree temperatures, maybe throw up a little shade covering or a little shade cloth and just keep it well watered within the first two weeks of establishment, especially. But once it gets established, you start to see some new leaves, then it pretty much is uh, good to go. Where do you get those seeds? Uh, we actually source them from our farm. We have third generation ashwagandha seeds that we sell on our site, urbanaustin.com. Um, additionally, we have them at the farmer's market, but one source that I really like to go through is strictly medicinals. Um, they have seeds from ashwagandha plants that I believe were cultivated initially in Africa. So they're used to a little bit more tolerant. Uh, strictly medicinals is out in California. So the climate's a little bit different. Although this year, I don't know with the heat wave that they have going on. So uh, stragulus, where do you get that? Again, yeah, I would recommend strictly medicinals as a great seed source for that. Um, we do not have astragalus seeds, unfortunately. I have not had the opportunity to catch the flowers. So I would say strictly medicinals would be your best bet. Um, what part of the uh, moringa do you eat? Yeah. 
So Moringa is very generous in that you can enjoy the leaves, you can enjoy the immature seed pods, you can even, um, I believe over in India, they actually will grind up the root and utilize it as a condiment. So virtually all parts, and I believe the branches as well, but obviously it's branched, so that might be a little bit tricky, but all parts of the Moringa plant are edible. Uh, do you cut the tree back each year or does it die back or does it come back from the cold? In my experience, it completely dies back with the cold. The root system tends to be a little bit more shallow. So I've even tried in the past to mulch all the way up um, halfway through the tree. And I've had a couple survivors that way, but I typically, it, it's, I just count it as an annual crop and we move on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that blue pea is very popular and not really viable. Do you have any yeah. ideas about where to get that? Yes, yes. So this is a tricky one. Um, I threw it out there initially, but if you're looking to start with a transplant and you don't want to go through the finicky germination process, Garden of the Ancients, uh, a nursery that's up in Manor, Texas, not too far from here at all, uh, they actually have a uh, great stock of blue butterfly pea right now. I believe in gallon sized pots and then they also have four inches right now as well. Uh, what are the tricks for germinating? Ooh, blue butterfly pea. So it has a little bit of like a, a larger seed which makes it easier to go through and stratify or scarify rather. Um, so I'll take clippers away from the hilum on the opposite side and I'll clip it. And then I'll go through and I'll soak the blue butterfly pea and a seaweed water dilution overnight. And that tends to allow the seed to swell up to take on water. And then that significantly increases uh, germination rates. Somebody who commented a hundred years or more ago, there used to be entire garden shows devoted to varieties of dandelions. I love that. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Teresa says hummingbirds love my comfrey. Uh, I love them. Heat point. I'm not sure what they're referring to, but what's an okay heat point? Maybe that's to. Oh, probably for drying. Probably for drying. Yeah. That's my guess. Uh, I'd say, again, you want to keep it no, no, no hotter than 90 degrees. Probably 85 to 90 is that threshold. Um, we do a lot of cold air drying too, and it seems to work just fine. And then you get beautiful, vibrant plant material off of it. Uh, so it should look, when you're drying, a plant should look as close to how it did in life in its dried form. That's when you know you've succeeded. Does anyone have any questions they want to say or speak up and say? Go ahead. Let me get a second. I have resources that I completely forgot to make note of. I'm so sorry. Uh, I've got some books for you <laughs> that I have been basically my Bibles on the farm. Uh, I completely recommend them. They're wonderful. So I recommend the Organic Medicinal Herb Farmer. This is by Jeff and Melanie Carpenter. They are wonderful. They're up in Vermont. So some of the material doesn't translate to Central Texas as well as I'd like, but it's a great starting off point. They go through the whole process and they're wonderful. So I recommend that. Um, the other book I recommend that is my second Bible is The Chinese Medicinal Herb Farm by Peg Schaefer. Uh, she actually consulted with us when we were going through and getting our farm started up. Uh, she's a wonderful wealth of knowledge and a great resource, but this book also goes through her entire process. Um, there's a lot of crossover herbs between Chinese medicine and Western medicine. So there's different techniques that both of those implement that are very helpful. Um, the other one is Skip Richter's book. This is a really good one. Kind of gives you a month to month gardening. Adore Skip, he's wonderful. And this is a very helpful book that we utilize a lot in our growing practices. And then uh, I actually am an educator with the Wildflower School of Botanical Medicine and that is run by Nicole Telkish. And this is her book, Medicinal Plants of Texas. It is wonderful uh, to go through. It's for practicing herbalists, but it goes through kind of the wild plants and wild offerings. If you want to get a better understanding of what native plants are in Texas and what's medicinally viable for an herb. 
Yeah, so Garden of the Ancients is the nursery that you mentioned in Maynard. Yes. Um, Lone Star Nursery has uh, also has ashwagandha there as well. Yes, <clears throat> they do. Can, can I ask a quick question? Would you mind holding up the third book again? Absolutely. Um, I believe that was Skip Richter's book. Yes, there we go. Five month gardening in Texas. I think it's going backward, and I apologize. I can send the list out to everybody too if that would be beneficial. Yes, thank you. Definitely. All right. What excellent information. Yeah, so much great info. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us tonight. Uh, yeah. And those printed pictures were very easy to see. Yeah. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a huge honor. <laughs> well, if, um, if no one else has any questions, we can go ahead and sign off tonight. I noticed that um, one person shared um, in the chat that Tim Miller is having a tree workshop. So if anybody's interested in that, um, big tree workshop on the 24th. So you can check that out. I think he posted it on our um, Facebook group as well. He did. Yeah. Good deal. You get a tree for free. <laughs> there you go. So uh, uh, I will say I, he had one a few years ago that I went to and we got to go all over his farm and see the ways that he conserves water and, and grows everything and tasted some of the figs, which were very good. And I came home with my own little helped fig tree. So nice. it was great. I enjoyed it. Wonderful. Well, we want to welcome, thank for everyone for coming and uh, we had a good time and uh, it was a great midsummer talk. <clears throat> yeah, and we hope to see everyone next month for a talk about the food forest, the Festival Beach Food Forest. So and we look forward to seeing everybody again. And if uh, you're interested in being on our board as a um, member at large, please let us know. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank y'all. Bye.